I hope you're feeling special. The famous phrase, Vincent Barry, entrepreneur, private investor, and the man who knows everything about wealth. This is where wealth is, gets really complicated. Life is a movie and business is a game. The biggest win is that you woke up. If I could go back, I wish I went that route. So yes. you're telling me you don't have the time. So it's a mindset. Selling oil is a very serious business. A lot of people don't know this, but you're going to get an exclusive. So I didn't even go to a top university and I still ended up at a top law firm. It changed my life. This one book. Do you have any secrets about the corporate game? Information is the most important asset. But it was the best job of my life. And she was the chairman of Chelsea Football Club. I used to work seven days a week. So people need to understand these three fundamentals. Global GDP was about 103 trillion. But there are three ways you can really make money in property. The cash flow is the most important thing. This is a list of 20 things you can do to go and get money. They want to take the power from the mass. But together, we can take the power and put the power right back. Thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of the CEO Journey podcast where we talk about all things business and entrepreneurship. Today I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by an entrepreneur, private investor and the man who knows everything about wealth, Vincent Champagne. Um, Vincent Barry, how are you doing man? How's life treating you? Yeah, very well. I, lo I love the introduction. It's, a, it's an amazing introduction. So Cheers, yeah, man. very, very well. And yeah, uh, just um, on social media, and I'm feeling special at the moment. So to your viewers at home, I hope you're feeling special. The famous phrase. <laughs> so, yeah, so everyone's feeling special. I'm feeling special. I'm really excited about this episode, really. So there's a lot to learn. So at the end of this discussion, you would have learned something about entrepreneurship and wealth. And it's really, really important. So thank you for having me. Thank you to all the predecessors. You've had some really, really good guests from Pierce Linney. I think you had another American guy as well who was really good uh, yes. the last couple of episodes. He was, that was a really good episode. So yeah, shout mm -hmm. out to every single person you had. Um, rent to rent. So you've, you've done a lot. You've done a lot. So for this one, it's going to be on wealth. It's going to be outside the box. It might be controversial, but you know we've got to give the right That's what we like, man. The right people. We like a yeah. bit of controversy. But yeah, no, we're all about <laughs> shedding advice. So... Yeah, I'm just glad that you're completely in line with that. Um, and obviously, you've got, you know, Wealth University. Um, you've got mm. the performance program coming out on the 14th of um, May. May. So yeah. I'm sure life's busy for you. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just talk a bit about, I guess, what you're doing with that and what's your motivation, what you're trying to help people do, essentially. So with me, what my motivation is and what I learned. So reason why I'm built, I built Wealth University is because I realised there's a gap in the market on how people understand wealth and finance. And the reason why I built it is the other day, I've had a mentee the other day, and this really important fundamental aspect when I asked him a question and he couldn't answer the question. So he basically, he's, um, he's in university at the moment right. and he wants to get into investment banking. And he said to me, I want to get into investment banking. So I asked him, why do you want to get into investment banking? And he just said, oh, working in finance, people in finance make money. Mm. So I had to probe him and say, well, what, what about finance? What do you mean by they make money? Like, can you explain it to me? But he said, I don't really know much about finance, um, but I want to get into investment banking. So for me, I realized that it's very, very important that we understand the fundamentals of finance. And mm. this is where wealth it gets really complicated. And a lot of people don't understand this. So, for example... If you're a student, you are a participant in the financial industry. If you have a credit card, you are a participant in the financial industry. If you have a bank account, you are a participant in the financial industry. So we're all participants. So I said to him that you're a participant and we have to understand how the infrastructure works. And once you understand how the infrastructure works, then we can learn how to operate within it. So what Wealth University is about is teaching you how the infrastructure in the Western world works and then figuring out how you're going to operate in it. So whether you're going to be an entrepreneur, mm. whether you're going to work, play, work in corporate, uh, whether you're going to try and build a career and do property on the side or have a side hustle, is teaching you those fundamentals. So that's what Wealth University is about. And what I'm, my message is to teach people the essence of how finance works how the game works because to me and everybody should understand this life is a movie and business is a game mm. so when i say life is a movie when you get up today so i'll give you an example 
so give me some of the wins that you had today. That's give me a win that you you felt that you had today. I mean, it could even be um, as simple as just getting out of bed early, um, showing up, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting graft on for this podcast. Small mm-hmm. wins, I think. Yeah, yeah. So okay, I'm going to ask you another question, and this is about well, this is going to be a bit more interactive. So let's say, let's say we've done this before. I gave you a million pounds, right? Yeah. You'll be happy. You're going to be happy with that, right? Of course, million if pounds. I give you, if I give you a million pound, but you can't wake up tomorrow, would you take the million? Million pounds, but I can't say, wake up tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. No, I wouldn't. Okay, so the biggest win that everyone needs to understand is that you woke up. Over two billion people die, go to sleep, don't open their eyes, and there's over two billion lives, babies created. In this in this planet, so the biggest win is we woke up today. That's a big win because there's some people that didn't wake up because it's not about the money because you won't take the money if you can't wake up. So starting with the first biggest win, you wake up in the morning. So for me, I'm grateful for waking up in the morning. Okay, then I'll get up. I will open my eyes. I feel special when I woke up. Wake up as well. Everyone should feel special. So I wake <laughs> up and I go into the mirror and I say I feel special. I actually say it. Because people need to understand, you woke up today. There's yeah. people that didn't. Okay, so then I get up in the morning. So my first win is I've trained. I go to the gym. So I've now done something really hard that I had to do. And the reason why I say it's very important to be grateful for the basic things is that in the Western world, we have so many wins that we don't understand. So if you go to your shower right now mm. and you have hot water, that's a win. It's mm. a small win. There's people, or sometimes they say take cold showers so you can actually feel the impact, but that's a small win. If you go to your tap and there's water there, there's some countries where water is, is valuable, that's a win. You have your coffee, everything's there. Everything, things are even delivered to you. So we have these basic wins that mm. we have to be grateful for every single day. If you And I want people to change the way that they view things. So I always say to people, don't say I have to do it. Say I get to do it. So I always say to people, I get to get up today. Yeah. I get to go to the gym. Because there's some people that some people can't walk. I get to open my eyes. I get to see. Mm-hmm. I get to pick up my kids sometimes. Because some people can't have kids. So I get to drive. Sometimes you drive. Have you got a car? Yes, I do. I, I do. get to drive my car. There's people out there that don't have a car that wish they could have Completely. a car. So mm-hmm. we get to do those things. So it's all about gratitude and teaching you about the small wins so then you can go on and make the big wins. So Wealth University, it isn't for everyone. It's mm. for anyone that really wants to work hard. And that's that's what Wealth University is about. And we teach you those fundamentals. So when I said that life is a movie, I'm going to go mm. back to that, is that the movie is how you decide how you want to live your movie. So uh, you get up today, mm. you can design the perfect day. So say imagine you didn't get up early today, for example, you can design your day, so your movie, and if you align that, so say say we go today, I I didn't work out today, or I got up at this time, I was on this table by this time, I've done four hours work to 10 o'clock, okay, from there, I'll do this, I'll do this, and you can tell your day, at the end of the day, you can reflect and say, I didn't like that day, but then you get to get up and do it again tomorrow. So yep. that's the movie. That's the that's where we need to understand our movie, where we are in life, where, where our movie, our family, our loved ones. Now, when I say business is a game, is that it is a game. That we have different games. We have the money game. We have the corporate game. We have the property game. And why I say it's a game is because you're competing with different people to achieve certain things. So if you're right. at university, mm. you're trying to get a grade because you're all graded against each other. And most of the time, people want to graduate and get a job. So that's the mm. first game you're playing. So you're playing a university game. And the reason why I understand this is when I was at university, I realized it was a game where I thought I wanted to be a barrister. And yeah. I'd done work experience with, uh, it's called a mini pupillage. And I worked with um, quite a lot of successful barristers, but one's very successful barrister. And he taught me so much. And he's, he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a barrister because you guys make a lot of money. I want to work in the legal field. Mm. And he said, he laughed, but he said to me, but, that game has changed. That like my time, if you want to go into criminal, and this is when legal aid was coming in, he said that game's changed. And then mm. he said to me, Oh, I remember like when I was younger, and I remember my friend, 
because he said, oh, my friend, he became a corporate lawyer, an M&A guy. And he makes so much money. I thought, if I could go back, I wish I went that route. Even though he's, he's okay today, he said, I yeah. wish I could go that route. So then he said to me, oh, so do you want to, if you want to do this game, you're going to get the title, you're going to get the prestige, but you're not going to, it's not as lucrative as it was before. So I yeah. said to him, no. And I said, not really. So do you, what, how do you feel about going in being a corporate lawyer, uh, M&A lawyer? I said, well, he said, they make a decent amount of money. And it's a game that can still be played today as, as the markets are changing. Mm. Um, so I said, yeah. So he, he put me in top contact with the uh, corporate uh, lawyer, helped me a bit, CV, trying to sort that out. So he helped mm. me with that. But then he said to me, what grade do you want to get? And I said to him, I want to get a first. And he said to me, does your lecturer know this? And I said, no, and I, I'm just going to work hard and I'm going to do all the numbers and I'm going to do my best and do it. But he said, no, but your lecturer marks your assignment. You are a random number in this game of all your yeah. students. So yeah. if your lecturer doesn't know you want to first, how is he going to help? How are you going to get you? You're going to, you need to put your best foot forward. He said to him, next time, talk to your lecturer. Say mm. you want to get a first. He can't show you, but he can help you. So you can show him his, your assignment and he can say, I want to get a first. And he could be like, oh, that you need to edit that part, that paragraph, that paragraph. So I built you're building a relationship. So now I build a relationship. All my lecturers, they know me, they know my name, Vincent. They know I want to get a first. Oh, it's Vincent, I want to get a first. If Vincent wants to get a first, I get a first because now I, I they know what I want. I show them my assignments on time. Yeah. Then you get the first. I've got the first for that that assignment. So the reason why it's important you have to understand that game is that you have to understand university is a game. And then I always say. When you go out into the real world, that's when the game really starts. And you need to understand the corporate game is one of the biggest games that everyone plays, but not everybody knows how to play it. And the reason why I say this is because when you go to work, it is a game. But yeah. people don't understand because you want to get up in your career. You're going to have a boss that you might not like. But at the same time, he has to kind of like you have to play that game with the work drinks. You have to play that game. So... That's how I say to people, life's a game. And with Wealth University, we teach you how to play the game. So corporate game is one of them. No, definitely. And, you know, tying it back to, um, obviously, Wealth University and what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. Because, obviously, you're taking the approach and you have the approach of looking at it from more of a mindset perspective. Um, so are mm -hmm. you more about teaching people how to develop almost like a wealth mindset rather than showing them the vehicles that they can take to build wealth? Both. 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 So... Is a, so what is mindset game is one, but mindset game is the most important out of every game. It's not about the vehicles because I, I'll give you an example of people I've helped Benty. I've had an example where I've had a lady and she wanted to get her dream job. So she had a good job in tech. Right. So she makes a decent salary. I'll give her a salary, about 130 grand a year. A lot of people would love to have that salary. Yeah. But her dream job is to work in, do podcasting or and, and be over in that, that field to I work in that, that. side of, of okay. the business, to want to get into radio. So okay. in her eyes, she said, I don't have the time, but I really want to get into this. I really want to get into doing this. That's my dream job. That's where I want to be. I don't feel happy doing this. So then what I do is her mindset was she doesn't have time. So mm -hmm. I said to her, what do you do on the weekends? She said, oh, um, I don't know. I just go out with my friends and enjoy it. I said, well, you've got time on the weekends. So yes. you're telling me you don't have the time. So it's a mindset. So weekends said, are for work, man. The, <laughs> no, the weekends <laughs> are for work. And that's what I said. So I said to her, basically, what you have to do is, what's your situation? So she said she had uh, two uh, properties that she had as rental income. I mm. said to her, so I said, what is, what is an income that you could probably live off? I said, you're not going to get your salary, your top salary now. So you're going to have to sacrifice that. But you can, if you could live off a certain income, which is okay, that allows you to do your podcast, mm -hmm. would you be able to? Um, would you be able to do that or get into radio? She said, "Yeah." So I said, "The first step is you need to now work on the weekends on the podcast and the radio. That's what you have to do on the weekends. Mm -hmm. In the weekdays, now you're going to have to save a bit of that salary. So if you save six months, mm -hmm. you know you can live off that, and then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do two. You're gonna do both." So you're going to now have to sacrifice a lot. So you're going to work, you're going to go to work, but you're getting that money to go into this. You might need to get another property. She said, yeah. So I gave her a strategy 
and what she needs to do. Yeah. So then after eight months, she's able to quit her job because she can live off an income. And now she's the happiest person. And now she's, she's now doing what she wants to do in the podcast industry. And then her podcast is now eventually growing. But maybe two or three years time, it'll grow to a certain level. But it's not about how much she was getting from that salary because now she lives, her life's different. Her life setup is totally different now. So she gets, she has passive income. She still works in the properties. And then now she's now working and in, going into the podcast. So it's changing your mindset. That's the most important thing. It's not about the money. But again, the vehicles are very important. And I'm going to discuss some of the vehicles and understanding the fundamentals of wealth and understanding mm -hmm. the fundamentals of money as well because you need those, you need to understand those to actually build wealth. But the first thing is mindset. We need to change the mindset first. No, definitely. And I guess before we get into, you know, stuff about the vehicles and all of that great stuff, um, I can tell, and I'm sure a lot of people, other people will be able to tell that you're wired differently to a lot of other people out there. You have a different mindset um, and you just overall a different breed. So I'd like to understand where that came from and if this is something that you've always had or if you developed it, there's a certain point in your life that made you develop such a strong mindset to go out there and achieve. It is me, but it is wired as well. And I'll give an example for my parents. My parents are a very, very serious... Like, my dad was a very serious person. And when mm. I mean by my dad was a serious person, so my dad... This is why I say the Western world, because my dad... He went to, he came to the UK, studied, um, uh, and then he went, he done banking and finance early days. But then my dad went back to Nigeria and my dad used to sell oil. So mm. they called them gunslingers. Like selling oil is a very serious business. It's quite a gangster business because yeah. you've got to take tanks around the world. So mm. my dad was a very serious guy. Ended up being a politician, uh, his past, but um, very, very serious. So my dad, from fundamentals, Sometimes mothers can mother call to you and be like, and my dad used to say, "Oh, it's nice," but my dad was like, "No, like you need to be like you need to be serious." Like mm. from eighteen, this is what you're going to do because at the first at the time in school, I was a bit naughty in school, and then I remember on the summer I went back because I used to see my dad. I used to go back and forth, and I saw my dad in the summer, and my dad and that summer, and this is where I changed my mindset. My dad said. We're gonna spend some time together, and we went on a ship. Like he went on a tanker. He's doing the job, carrying something. Well, we was meant to do it for three weeks, but we done it for one week. And I'm on the ship, and my dad. He, he taught us how to do stuff. He taught us how to fight, kill snakes, shoot guns. We know how to do all of that. So not, right. I'm not saying everyone should, but he taught us how to do that. You kind of when you're in different developing countries, you have to learn that. So I'm mm. on a ship, a tanker, carrying oil, and he he said there's pirates. He has guns. We've got guns on the ship, by the way. He said, well, I don't want you to die, but I have to teach you a lesson that how serious life is. So mm. from that weak experience, I said, I just straightened out. I said, you know what? It's, it's too hot. Like, there's, there's different aspects of it. So when I, when I got back from there, that's when I, I hit everything heavy, like literally everything mm. heavy. And the reason why I'm able to teach this, because I've been on the four sides of the spectrum. So I've been on the entrepreneurship side. So a lot of people don't know this, but you're going to get an exclusive. I started off with a nightclub, right. actually. So I started in the night industry mm. but by 19. So I ended up having, I ended up working as a promoter and I ended up getting equity um, in, in a nightclub. That's how I started. So that industry from there, from 19, to get equity in a nightclub and running that as an adult, because you're an adult now, and learning that industry is a very, very fast-paced industry but you learn so much from when you work with people at night two colors things happen people get drunk fights so i learned in those two years that was my skill for life because i learned so much in those two years i realized and how i say life is a game is the reason why i went into law is because i sold my share right. and i had a lawyer and then my, I saw how much money my lawyer made and it <laughs> yeah. pissed me off. It actually yeah. pissed me off so much that he just done a bit of paperwork mm. and, I, and I had to pay him like about 50 to 60K for just doing some small paperwork. So yeah. that's when I looked at him and I said, I need, how did he do that? And he didn't, he didn't even do anything. I had to do everything, get everything together, obviously mm. my accountant and stuff. And all he done, obviously he done a bit, but not much. And he just charged me, he gets a percentage of the deal. So that's when I said, okay, I spoke to him and 
made a reasonable amount of money and then put and this is where he, this is where it was very crucial and he said to me you've got two choices at 19 you can use that money or i can put that money in a trust right. and you can't access it to a certain age and i said and, I, and he said then and he said to you you can figure out what you're going to do because the industry changed so i said you know what i want to go to university so he said you know what i'll put this in a trust for you you go university when you get to a certain age, you can access that, and then you just figure out. You just start again. So I had a really having a really good lawyer early. He taught me, and that's when I learned, I learned about a trust. So from nineteen, I understood a trust. So then mm. now I thought, okay, I'm going to go and do this. So that's when I went to university to do law. I thought, okay, let me go and do that game because yeah, that's yeah. the important game. So I'm mm. on that side. So that I've been on the entrepreneurship side. Now I'm on the working side, um, university working for a firm, and I'm going to go through how to get into the to one of the top firms and how information is how you need to use information importantly but that's where i am so that's i've I've done that game then i went into the working game that's the corporate game done that then i went into m a which is the buying businesses game which is working in private wealth that's another game raising capital that's big money and then i realized something there then i went into private investing we're in private investor, done that for a bit. And then I thought, you know, you know what? I want some social media. I want the tech game. So now Wealth University really is a tech company. It isn't It's actually the tech game. So now I'm on the other side. So I'm always developing somewhere else in the social media games. So I said, you know what? I need to come on this game and let's work on that one. No, definitely. Um, so, you know, taking that corporate route after university, um, mm-hmm. Could you share, like, do you have any secrets about the corporate game? Um, anything, yeah. key lessons you learned while taking that route? Because I assume that you were always naturally entrepreneurial. And so you could have probably, you know, decided in yourself to go, you know, start a business and be your own boss. But then, you know, you took a different approach. So mm-hmm. what are the key lessons you learned from taking that approach? And um, any secrets that you've got from that industry that you'd like to share? That would also be, also be great. Yeah. Okay, so the most important thing that people need to understand, and it's even easier now, is information is the most important asset you're ever going to have. So Mm. the reason why I said you need to get, you need to find someone, and it's very important. Wealth University is actually an alternative to the traditional education system. And Mm. I'm going to break down in five minutes the infrastructure and the traditional education system, why it doesn't set you up to build wealth. It just sets you up to work, get a job, maybe get a mortgage, retire, and then die. Mm. That is the infrastructure that's been built for you. And you need to understand that different people have a different interest. There's a conflict of interest in the infrastructures, that from the banks to the government to Mm. your teacher. And we need to understand. And this is where mentors are very, very important. So for me, the legal game, I needed to conquer that. So the first thing I really wanted to be, go and be a top, go to a top law firm, effectively. But I'm wide different. I wanted to remove every single privilege that I have. So when I make it, they cannot tell me because I went to this school, because I went to a private school mm. up before six, and I rolled myself in um I enrolled myself into a normal comprehensive school because I wanted to take I didn't want the privilege. Then we A levels, done A levels, got into Oxford, by the way. I went oh. to Oxford later and do my non-executive. Mm. But I, I went to the open day and I said, you know what? I don't want to go to this university. Because if I make it, they're just gonna tell me because I went to Oxford, I made it. So I'm I'm a living proof here. Yeah. No, I didn't even go to a top university and I still ended up at a top law firm. But I'm going to give you, so I removed, I'm wide different, so I removed that privilege. So I went to Staffordshire University, I went to Staffordshire University. I went to different ones, I thought, that's me, that's okay. It's an experience for me, I'm going to learn different things. So I went to Staffordshire University, I've got every other privilege. So to get into a top law firm, I'm a, uh, what's, what are the, let me ask you the requirements. What are the requirements to get into a top corporate? If you can well, give them to me, you know this, because you're, yeah. you're, you're there. So what are the requirements? No, I've, so I've been actually applying to apply to some, you know, big places for mm-hmm. placement for next year. And, uh, you know, they have their own assessment. So first you've got the, you know, CV, and you've got your cover letter. Um, mm-hmm. That's basically, I'm guessing, like a checklist. I mean, there's so many people applying to these places that are just like, mm-hmm. right, check through. And then they send you their assessment to do. Um, and their assessment is 
or I describe it as, I, I mean, I see it as a load of bullshit, to be fair, <laughs> but it's um, basically just like, you know, uh, numbers, pattern recognition. Um, I've had some weird ones, to be honest, but it's almost like, I, I mean, I remember doing it and thinking, you know, how on earth does this apply? But I'm sure it does. Um, it doesn't, but go on. <laughs> and, and it then, was a filter system. Yeah. No, definitely. And then after after that, then you have an interview. I'm guessing, um, and you know, you probably have two or three of those interviews. Maybe you know the latter ones are with director or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of stages to it, and it's quite complex. Um, and so yeah, I guess that's everything that I know off the top of my head from applying to you know some mm-hmm. of the big places placement mm-hmm. work. Yeah, perfect. So basically, the requirements generally is a red bit university, a 2-1, effectively, to get a chance mm. to compete. That's it. And then if someone else can come in, they have to do something exceptional to get in. So I'm buried out from that example, from there. Mm. That's, the, that's the first example. <laughs> okay, so information. So what I've done, I was... And I need people to understand this, yeah? When you're obsessed with something, you will figure out a way. And when I mean you need to not be lazy, when I said I wanted to be a corporate lawyer, I used to now, I bought this book. I bought books on it, by the way. But I bought this book, this one mm. book. It changed my life. This one book is called Richard's Sekinder. He wrote this book, a professor. And the book was called Tomorrow's Lawyer. And the book was about how the legal system is going to change. That those top, the top law firms, they're going to have a competitor. And there was something called alternative business structures, which is a license that the government gave to the big four accounting firms and other financial firms. They gave them a license now that they can mm. practice law and compete with some of the top firms. So mm. I read this book and I knew about ABS two years before it was coming in. So... When they had ABS, I realized I applied for top law firms, mm. but I'd always get to second stage. I can never get past second stage for some reason. Yeah. So I, I decided that I'm going to go and apply to the big four, which is PwC. Right. And then, then from that day, I could get the big clients. And I'm in, and now I'm, I'm competing with the people from top law firms. Oxford, Cambridge, Gadget, everything. everyone who was on big four. Most people did go Oxford and Cambridge. I was probably was the only one and three other people. I think one person went to King's College. Uh, one person went to see. I was probably the only person from Southampton University, effectively. So oh. I, I understood that information. But however, how I got there, and this is very important, is when I finished university, I didn't see the hardest bit about uni is when you finish, there is an expiry date for you. You got like three or four years to try yeah. and get in. Because after that, if you work a job, you kind of get stuck into that and it's hard to transition. transition so that's why I say getting a proper job is a very difficult, so you have a window. So my fir- so I said to myself, because I graduated in the recession, the worst recession, like I graduated during that time. So we were just, I think we we're just coming out of it, but it was, so it was, there was, it was a very difficult period. I remember there was people that used to go and protest. They used to have signs saying, hire me. That's how, that is how bad it was. Gosh. Literally, that was like thinking outside the box. Graduates wanting to mm. get into investment banking, they will have these signs up. So I'm not going to go and take a sign. But so what I done is when I finished, I said to myself, I'm, I'm, and when I graduate, I'm just going to get a job. I need to get a job. I need to just work. I don't care. I'm going to be that graduate that gets a job. So an opportunity came for me. It was called a business analyst job. It was at the Royal Bar- Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. It turned out to be a PA job. They even finessed me on the job title. But because <laughs> the graduates are so desperate, I remember Jesus. they started making legal and graduate jobs because it was the market. They started making, everyone started having graduate schemes. And it's not a graduate job, it's just a normal job. But they changed it because the government needed funding to say, okay, we've got this amount of graduates mm. and jobs. So, but it was the best job of my life. Because I was a PA to like one of the heads of the service, and she was the chairman of Chelsea Football Club. Right. This, this, so this connection. So when I when you graduate, you finish your first job. So what she taught me is she taught me about the office. Office. So she said to me, "You're going to be my ears for the whole office. So I need to know. You need to know about." Who does this for tea? Who does? I need to know every single information about 
the people that work and you're just going to be a normal buffet and, and you're just going to be impartial. You're not going to say nothing. You're going to always be neutral because in this office, people will talk, people will do that, people will do that. But you are just going to be neutral because you represent me. So when I'm not here, you're, you can sit on my desk and be nice to everyone. And then, and then I'll ask, and then she asked me and I got all the information and said, oh, she already knew this, but she was just testing me. So I got all the information. So from that job, being a PA, organizing diaries, doing meetings, it mm. gave me the business professionalism that I had. Right. The, mm. the doing deadlines, doing the admin. My admin was so on point. So that job taught me the fundamentals to actually go in. So when I when I interviewed, so what what happened with that job is that yeah. they only give you a year anyway, and then they they get another intern. So right. what happened is I had to I, I lost that job because they at the at the end they 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 got another intern. So then I was applying for my training contract and I had to get the training contract for PW. I had to get it. it. There was no other option. I had to get it because I already moved out of my house. I was already independent. Uh, so I had two months and I had, I had two months. I had a month's salary and I, had to, I didn't even have enough money to get to that job. I had, right. to, I had to get the bus. I had to do this crazy Oops. route. I had to get in at seven o'clock in the morning to get right. on my first two. I got paid for PWC for my training contract. So... It was a very, it was, it was weird. It was a fight or flight moment. And, but with that, it taught me so much yeah. about the game, about the, about the, about the corporate game. So I realized, okay, I'm going to play this game and I'm going to play it to the best of my advantage. And the reason why I say life's a game is that when I joined PwC, yeah. the first question, cause you get, in, you get, you, when you join, you get to meet and you get to meet them, you get to meet the different partners. Mm. So you, whatever desk you are, so when I met the partner, I asked him, I said to him, what did you do to get to partner? And what, do, what could I do to make life easier for you? And what, what are the things I shouldn't do uh, as well? Right, okay. It's the, a very crucial question to ask yes. him. And he laughed, yeah. he laughed, but he, he, he said, you know what? No one's ever asked me that question in the amount of time. And he said, he said to me, these are, these are what it is. I was always the first one in. I was always the last one out. Right. That was the first rule. And people look at this as well. People the, the, so you're the first one in. So, okay, I took that rule. That's the first one. The second rule, he was like, I always used to go to drinks and do things because a lot of the time, you know, different people, that's how you do business within the departments, you know, relationships, yeah. try and build better relationships. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's the second. Okay. Then the third, he said, make sure your work's good. Obviously, you work hard. Your work's good. And then he then and then he said something. Then he said, "Oh, but you know what it annoys me because it's getting so casual." My day, I always had to wear a tie, like things a bit more casual. But he said, oh, "Obviously, we we're doing this period." But the seniors think this in the back of their head. Right. Some of them don't even like brown shoes. They won't tell you. So I had I listened to all these things. Like, okay, fair enough. So what I done is I always had three suits. I had a navy suit. I had a pinstripe suit which I call the power suit when I'm going to do something big with a client. And then right. I had my Friday casual suit. Because some people think just down Fridays, they come in casual yeah. and it changes your image when you see someone. But yes. they never ever saw me casual. So I will come in a casual suit with trainers on a Friday. So mm -hmm. they're the three things. So I was known as the smart guy at work. Everyone said, oh no, that's Vincent, he's a smart guy. Yeah, yeah. Keeps me, he's a smart and I'm building a reputation, a reputation yeah. working late. I used to work, I used to work seven days a week as well. Explain about working seven weekend, days work. a week. So, um, was that like clocking in a lot of overtime then? How, how was that working? Were you working like what, what were the hours looking like for you when you were at that stage? I was only like, working these 80 to 100 hours a week. Jeez, right. Okay. But, but the reason why, and I was number one performer, is because on the weekends, see, the, the reason why. You need to make your manager's life easy. If they yes. know you can do their job, yes. they give you more work. That gives you more profile on your CV. So at first, and I'll give you a good example. My first, when I first joined, we'd done an IPO for 100 million for CMC Capital Market. Yes. So my managing partner, she was a lovely lady. I had a, we had a meeting and then we went to the client and the client said, oh, um, we're thinking of doing an IPO. And she said, oh, Vincent can do that. I don't even know what an IPO is. Yeah. But I'm saying, yeah, I can do it. And I said, initial public offering, and I'll explain what that is. Yes. So I'm saying, yeah, I can do that. And then she's like, yeah, you can do that. Um, we've got the good thing at PwC. They've got case studies, got everything. There's a library for every single, every major. Yeah, just look at a couple of case studies. Um, 
Uh, any questions? We've got an expert here. Go talk to her over there. She's an expert in restructuring. She's an expert and she's done two IPOs. Just talk to her, bounce your work. And then, yeah, and then we'll meet the client next week with you. Mm -hmm. She didn't come with me. So the next week, I got the information. I figured out what it was. Looked at all the case studies. Very simple. Not a simple process, but I understood it. Watched a few YouTube videos. Yeah. Okay, but I understand what the initial public offering is. And initial public offering is basically when a company wants to raise a big amount of capital and they're doing a reasonable uh, turnover, they can go and list the company on another stock exchange to get investors to invest and that you get a big amount of capital. And that's how founders exit. So that's called a big yeah. exit. So you want to float it. And, I, and I've delisted the company from London Stock Exchange as well. But so we done, so we showed them how to, how to do it. The next week I'm doing a meeting with the client. He's the founder, chairman, board, legal team, everything. And we're telling them, pitching to them how we're going to do the IPO. So, and she was confident in me. I showed the work. She said, yeah, good, go, go for it. If you've got confidence, done it, easy. Not, and yeah. then that's it. And then now you get different work. So now... I started to realize you can actually structure what you want to do. So you do, I used to do my work, but then I used to do extra work. So I used to talk to people, oh, I'm interested in doing that. Um, I'm interested in what you've done with that. And they say, oh yeah, and they'll show you. And they say, if, you've got, if you've got capacity, they'll give yeah. it to you. So for me to have capacity, I'll just do the work on the weekends. And I started building a relationship. I started building a reputation. I started restructuring. I started doing this. I started, I've done so many things in, that, in those mm. two years. And I got the amount of knowledge I got was yeah. phenomenal. And then the next question, which why information is key, I said to my the senior partner, I said, what what do I need to become partner? What is the what do I need? And they explained, she said, what, she said, what do you mean? I said, no, no, what is it specifically? Because I'll research. And they usually is you buy into the firm. So you usually you put two hundred or three hundred thousand into a firm. And usually people remortgage their house, or you bring in a client. They said if you bring in a client that's about two hundred million, gives mm. us two hundred million, then you make partner. So I have that information. So then I said, okay, so I just need to get a client. I even said to him, I just need to get a client. I need to get a billionaire, basically, and I'll become partner. I yeah. said, if I do that, you'll make me partner. And she said, she laughed. And she said, oh, how are you going to find a billionaire? I said, don't worry, I'll find one. Yeah. And that's it. So I said, yeah. Okay. So at the time, I was thinking Russian. Who, who, are, who are the billionaires? The Russians. The Russians. So now I'm hanging out and make, I'm trying to find a Russian, a client on the weekends. Uh, to bring him in and that's, yeah. that's that's what i pretty much had to do and i learned that game and that's what I was, I was focusing on that so i understood that but the reason why i left the industry is because partnership back in the day you used to get equity yeah but they changed it and they called it a salaried partner so you only get a higher salary but you don't get equity so that game's changed so i oh. realized there's no point working my ass off to be partner because i'll just get a yeah. higher salary and that's why i moved left left that game but as I say, information is key and graduates need to get mentors. You need to find someone that's in that industry at least five years because mm. anyone too older will understand. So someone working in it two or three years and ask them and they'll, they'll tell you what you need to do effectively. Yeah. No, 100 percent. Yeah. And like a key, key thing that I'm learning from this podcast is the um, importance of building such strong relationships, um, expanding yeah. your network. And I think a lot of people nowadays are too focused on the bag and the quick bag, and they aren't focused on building up a network that is absolutely indestructible. So how does someone go about, or how does even someone that could be as, as early as approaching someone, how does someone go about building such a strong relationship with someone? And if we're looking at your past, what were the key relationships that you made at a young age to set you up for the rest of your life? Okay, I'm going to give you an example right now that I just thought of this on the spot. If I say it's so easy now, because mm. you, you've got online, but I'm going to give you an example what you can do. Okay, and if someone does this, if someone's smart enough, someone is going to watch this and is going to do this. Okay, Your network is so important. And I say mm. that because I solve people's problems mm. because of network. And people join, a lot of people need to understand you could be a wealthy, let's say a wealthy Qatari or wealthy Russian, mm. and you can't get your kids into a school in London because you don't have that relationship. Mm. And people need to understand. So the reason why wealthy people join these firms or use 
us to represent them is because we have the relationship with most like institutions, for example. So we, as if you're if you work for Big Four, so I'm going to explain the infrastructure, which is important to understand. I'm going to quickly break it down. The infrastructure is basically built like this, and it's and this goes out to the fake traders as well. So this is why <laughs> I'm I'm putting this option up because Scammers. I'm sick and tired of these fake traders mm. saying to me. I can make you a thousand percent return and you can just follow my signal and my strategy yeah, <laughs> and it's going to make me money. And it, it, it really puzzles me, but it's, I mean, this is important. This is why it's educational. So the infrastructure, how we actually work, I'm going to break this down. So when you see a fake trader, you can swap them because I'm yeah. sick and tired of these, these fake traders. So what, this is how it actually works. Okay. So we have a system called capital markets. Capital markets is an essential process for the Western world to function. And I need people to understand the difference, the reason why we have money. Because money is literally a commodity, which is to transact people's wants and needs. That is all money is. And people mm. need to understand that. So what, I need, what you need to understand is there's three rules, fundamentals to money. And this is taught in wealth. And this is what we, we know fundamental when you work in private wealth if you're if you're a wealth manager if you're an investment manager if you're a mm. private wealth manager if you're a hedge fund manager you know these principles so people need to understand these three fundamentals so first stage is money can only be taken yeah i need people to understand this we don't make we can't create money because we're not the banks we can't print money so it, it only can be we're not the federal reserve so we can't print it so it only can be taken right the second fundamental is money can only be, you can only hold on to money as well. So that's a, there's a holding on to stage. And then the third stage is money can only be transferred. There are free rules to money. So for example, you take money, you go to work for a corporate, you take money, you either get a loan to start a business or you start a business, provide a product or service to some, an individual. Yeah. Holding on to money is, let's say you start making money. You just start, you say you start saving it. That's holding on to it. So that, that's, that's, a, that's an in-between state. And until you transfer it, you've done nothing with the money. So transferring it can be you kind of can spend it. So people work and spend the money. Or you transfer it, you work, and then you buy a property. That's transferring it. And then the stage goes again. So people need to understand those three principles is the fundamentals of how the capital markets work. So I'll give you an example of how the system works. So we have the, we have the banks on one on one side, yep. okay? And the bank's job is to loan money. And they will loan this money to a corporate, okay? So a corporate needs a loan. So they raise money, they need capital, so they need to raise it. So how they raise this is that they will have an institution, which is a pension fund, who needs to invest the money. So they, they're gonna get the money, put their money, with an investor, into an institution. So that's how an, an institution is loaning the money. So when they go to the stock exchange, they're using their shares as loan, right. as collateral, and then <clears> the <throat> investor, which is the institution, is going to get shares. And that is how it effectively works. So they, right. the, the corporate's going to have to grow. So that's the first side of capital markets. We have the banks who loan, we have the institutions who invest. Now, right. an investment bank is an intermediary. So he will go... If you want to float it, they will go and they say, what price do you want? Okay, we're going to find you the investor and then they're going to put money in and they're going to get shares and then that transfers and that's how it works. So that's the basics how the infrastructure works. So finance isn't complicated. It, it can get complicated when you still got primary and secondary markets, but that is the fundamentals that you need to understand. So there's a brokerage side of the business and the brokerage side of the business is where if you buy shares in let's say a certain corporate, there's a brokerage firm who just does the transaction for you. And then the brokerage side of the business, they are like the middlemen for you to buy shares in a company. So if you trade, let's say retail side, but the big money, they have a direct relationship with the exchanges. So they have a, a direct relationship with the exchange. So they understand it. And if you look at the exchanges, there's only three in the world that are owned by the same company anyway. But let's say the exchanges, let's, let's say for, for for good sakes, that they're not manipulating. So then we have the broker side of the business. So the retail money is where the broker side of the business, there, there's a decline and they need cash flow every single month. 
So they need people to blow up because they need your cash flow. The people that, the retail traders that make money and the funds, they have a direct relationship. They have a direct relationship with exchange. So they don't even go through brokerage. So they, yeah. many times, so the retail money that makes, but that's not enough for them. So they need capital every single month. So the brokerage side of the business, and these are all your different platforms, they need you to go onto the platform. So how do they do it? They need an affiliate. And this is where they get an educator, or I call them a charlatan trader. And his yes. job is to bring you onto that platform. So I'm what do they do? Sure. They say to you, I've got this lovely magical course. Follow my signal. They will stand next to a Lamborghini. Yeah. They will stand next to a nice car. Yeah. They might Airbnb be in a house. And they'll be with the phone like this. And they'll be trading. And they're saying this signal and that signal and the lifestyle. And they say, we have this secret strategy, which we can make you money. And the big secret is to send you that stupid course. So you need yeah. to understand that if they're trying to sell you some course that gives you a hunt, and you need to understand what people need to understand about the funds is they all work together. They, they have a strategy. They have a mandate. So they have a percentage. So how they, they want to trade whatever. Pension funds, hedge funds, property funds, they all do the same thing. They have a long portfolio. They have different desks or different strategies, managers that will do short, long, short, long, and they just want to be up. And, they, and how they make money is they get a big amount of capital. So let's say they have 100 billion or they have, they have 2 trillion under management. They're just going to make t maybe 10 or 12% a year. That's a, mm. that's, that is a good, that is a good um, return. return. Mm. And so the average person is, uh, how are they going to, how are they going to beat? Because when they, when, they, when they make moves, the market moves. But they need the retail money, which is important, because that's what really makes the market moves. The average person trading, trading, trading. That's a lot of volume if you look at how many people in the world. And they set the infrastructure because they have an impression. So when you look at the investment banks, you've got all of them. They already got good marketing. They've got good PR. They and they finance movies. So you they finance a lot of the, the movies. So if they're going to finance the Wolf of uh, Wall Street or they're going to finance an investment, they're going to make themselves look favorable. And this is where the problem happens, where they people have an impression of what it is to trade. The stock market has a very, very, very positive um, way that, oh, you can just go and make money and trade. But if you want to say gambling, the house always wins. So you have to have a strategy. If you're a resale trader, you have to have a strategy. It's not just finding some random person who's just going to learn something on YouTube and teach you how to trade. So now you know how the system works. You need to figure out how to operate within that infrastructure. And that's why you say get mentored. You can actually find someone that did trade that can teach you, but yeah. you have to look out whether they're regulated. So for me, you need to look at if they are a trader, Yeah, you can go and look at, they have to be regulated. So with the FCA, they have a, there's a qualification that you have to have. Just check if the FCA regulated. So for my example, for me to work in private world, I had to have a qualification called STEP. It's the Society of Trusted Estate Practitioners. To work in a family office, you cannot have that qualification. You need to have that qualification. And that qualification teaches me about trust, teaches me about investments, teaches me about stocks, teaches me uh, about uh, inheritance planning, from buying yachts to buying planes. It, it teaches you everything about different asset classes. So you need to understand it. So please just check the person is regulated first. Do not follow a lovely course or a lovely image that they're putting to you online because that person is just exactly the same as you. He's just rented out something and he's just sending you that course. And maybe they use the money that they sell the course for to then go and trade and maybe they make a big move with your money. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I think that's absolutely crucial as well, especially nowadays. There's so much scams flying about and you just got to, you know, be wary of it. And so like Vincent, you know, coming out of corporate life, um, mm -hmm. you took did you say you took the uh, private investor route yeah yeah so so what was that what were you doing there like what was the so, operation so what I so what I done so I when I finished um, at PwC mm. I noticed that I could be a consultant a contractor so mm. for my skills I started going so what I done is I went to organizations so with an organization they would need they need an M&A person 
mm. for most organizations. So what I learned is that with businesses, there's only three things that businesses really do in, in, in life is that I are going to grow, that I need to be restructured mm-hmm. or they either need a strategy in terms of if they're going to buy another business to grow. So that's, that's the three things. So as an M&A consultant, there's always, they always need an M&A expert because a CEO doesn't know how to buy another business. A CEO doesn't know how to raise money. So they bring in an M&A team. So when I say life is a game, when I was working as a lawyer, I, I realized there was this M&A guy. He, yeah. he was a contractor and he, he, they just hired him. You hire M&A firms as well, but there's no Pacific route how to get into M&A because it's, is like you have an accountant, you have a, a lot of people might be ex bankers and they go into M and A. So there's no clear yeah. route. But with him, because I understand the, tra- the transactional side from the legal side, I was experience working with him. Then he gave me some experience, and then I was like, okay, he taught me, okay, you can buy how to buy a business, you can structure deals. I know how to structure deals as a lawyer in anyway, but he taught me those. So now I worked as a consultant structuring deals. So then I'll go into organisation who are, who are just about to go through an M and A transaction. And they bring in an M and A expert, and that's when they brought me in as the M and A expert to do the deal. So you you're in organization for eight to ten months. How long the deal is, you move on. So I started contracting for about five to six years, and I learned a lot from that side. Then I thought I can just do it myself. So that's why I then started finding businesses, smaller businesses, yeah. putting them together, and then selling them to another business and just taking the fee, uh, a percentage fee for doing it. So that's when I was doing being a private investor for two to three years. And then I decided to build Wealth University. So I'll take a year out. I thought, you know what, this information, let's start, let's do this, let's do this. Cause I've been helping people for, you know what, let's give this information out, which costs a lot of money. So the wealthy had this information a long time. Yeah. When you're, when you, when you have a certain amount of money, which people need to understand, yeah. you can't have a normal bank account. You, yeah. you have a private bank account. And to get a private bank account, there's many different divisions. HSBC have theirs, but there's others. So a lot of people know Corpse is one of them. Yes. Uh, there's Bain and Bain. There's there's so many different family, small family private banks that people don't know about. Um, Alderman's one. But I'm going to give you, for example, you need to make over 350000 per annum to get a private bank account, or you need to invest at least, I think some of them at least a million in property or a million in assets to get this. So when you get a private bank account, this comes with a relationship manager. It comes with a tax expert. It comes with a corporate lawyer who's, who, and their job, not a corporate lawyer, a trustee. And their job is they're going to work with you to preserve your wealth. And this, right. is where, this is where they get access to it, which I was doing when I was at PwC and then when I worked in private wealth, when I was right, working okay. for and with, as a trustee, you have a specialist. So the thing that's important to understand is that most people and the really successful entrepreneurs master one skill and they learn how to do it really, really well, better than anyone else in the world. And, they, and that's how they get the big business or the business grows drastically. Yeah. But the yeah. problem is, is not everyone can master investing in different asset classes and that's what a wealth manager is able to do. The, our skill is taking your money, growing it, protecting it, and then transferring it. So what is the bigger plan? What is your, a lot of people will make the money, but then they want, what happens is, you've, like I said, that you're on the third stage, you need to transfer it. So let's say you, you have a client, he's got his company, sold it for, let's say, 100 million. He's now got 100 million. What's he going to do with that money? It's a transfer stage. So yeah. he needs to give it to loved ones, he, want, he might put it into a certain asset class. And what a wealth manager does or a trustee is we understand how to do multiple asset classes. That's our right. skill. Your skill is working on the one, growing it, but we can do multiple. So that I, I learned that skill and that, that's really, really important. But with Wealth University, I'm teaching that multiple skill, what you can learn. And these are, these are beneficial to the average ordinary person. So it's making the ordinary person be extraordinary. So the reason why is very important is that you don't have to have money to pass on money so some people think that they need so much amount but you can just have an insurance premium a whole life insurance yeah i will go for not a term life insurance but let's say and you can pass let's say for 100 pound a month 
you can pass five hundred thousand pounds to your loved ones. But the biggest killer of wealth is tax, and not everyone knows it. They're the biggest killer. So you need the best people, and it costs you a lot of money to go to these. The big that's why people pay for the big lawyers because they're basically be the best on tax and the big accountants because they're saving you on tax. So Wealth University teaches you those fundamentals. And the big example I use is a trust. That is the the biggest and best instrument that has been used by the wealthy for centuries to protect wealth and the assets. And mm. if you put that into a trust, then you can then avoid inheritance tax and then you can pass it on generation. So that's what you need to avoid. And, well, and there's nothing wrong with tax avoidance. Tax evasion is mm. illegal, but tax avoidance is legal. And everybody can play that game. It doesn't have to be a certain individual. So Wealth University teaches you about credit, teaches you about corporate game, teaches you about property game, teaches you about business flipping. It's every single thing to do with wealth that's helpful for you and mindset. And then you can now use that as an education system to help you. And the reason why I'm going to go back to the traditional education mm -hmm. system doesn't teach you this is because the traditional education system doesn't teach you how to pay tax. It doesn't no. teach you how to buy a business. It doesn't teach you how to buy a property. It doesn't teach you about credit or credit yeah. cards, how you can use them. And that's where Wealth University comes into. And the reason why I say is the education system has failed is because it upsets me sometimes, but your teacher is a cheerleader for the infrastructure that's been built for them. So yeah. whenever you're doing something that goes against it, they will say to you, so for example, if you said to your teacher, I'm going to start a podcast and I'm going to grow this podcast, your teachers will look at you like, oh, that sounds a bit risky. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, because they're part of the system that's fed yeah. them. So mm. you can't, and that's why I say you have to get mentors. If you, if you talk to the, uh, if you go in and spoke to someone that built a number one podcast and you say, I want to do that, he'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, do this, do that. I made these mistakes, but don't do that, do that. And then you get the steps. And I think with, with parents, the thing that's very difficult is they love you, but they are cheerleaders for the system. So I always mm -hmm. say to people, if your parents have been part of it, and I always say with a teacher, does your teacher run a multi-million pound corporation? A business teacher, by the way. If not, they can't teach you. It's just a textbook system. But you have to get mentors. And that's why I say alternative education system. So when you finish, when you go to work, that's the alternative. But mentors or wealth university that's the alternative to the edu education system no definitely and just i'd like to track back to what you were saying about a trust because i thought that was very you know interesting and like what what is a trust like just very simply like what is a trust is it a vehicle um and how does someone get into a trust is it through you know hiring a a lawyer or a wealth manager well what's mm -hmm. the crack with that okay so a trust it's just a financial legal instrument which is used to transfer money to a loved one. So we'll, I'll break down what a trust is, and there's different types of trust, but let's go with the basic trust, which is called a bear trust. So what a trust is, is that, for example, let's say I have a thousand pounds and I want to give that thousand pounds to my loved one when I pass away. Yeah. If I was to give that thousand pounds and let's forget all the tax rules about percentages and that, I'm just going to give you less. I'm just going to say, let's say it's 20 percent just to make it easier because it gets a bit complicated. If I was to give that thousand pounds to my loved one when I die, I will pay. And this is not true, but I'm going to give this is just a hypothetical. Mm. Well, I'm going to pay 20 percent inheritance tax for giving that person the thousand pounds. So I've lost 20 percent when I give them that. Let's say, let's make it, because it's more than that, it's about 40 or 45%. Let's say, let's say it's 50%, for example. I'm going to give half of that. So I, I give, I want to give you a thousand pounds. If I die, I have no, no will yeah. or no trust. I give half of my, so I, you end up with 500 pounds. Mm. That is, that's, that's robbery effectively. Yeah. So what a trust mm -hmm. does is, it protects the asset. And the reason why you want to use a trust is not just to do with transferring wealth, it's actually used to protect an asset. And I'm going to give you an example, a basic example why uh, vehicles are very important in business. Because every single corporation that 
all you guys work for, they have this structure, but they, they don't teach you it. So like, if you work, I'm going to give you an example. For example, if you work for, let's say you work for Sainsbury's. I'm going to yes. give you a good example because we work with one of the Sainsbury's family. They have a trust. And they call it a foundation. You look at Will Bill Gates, for example, right? He's donating all this money around the world and blah, blah, blah. He's just got a foundation. It's, it, there is positives to it, but there's ways where he's, 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 he's basically saving so much on tax. Yes. I'm not getting taxed at all. So mm. the reason why it's important to learn this is that if I was to transfer that thousand pounds, I will set up a trust. And with a trust, what you have is you have a trustee and then you have a settler. You're the settler. And then you set up the trust. You have a trustee. The trustee is can, can be your friend, can be someone reliable. It could be an accountant. It could be a lawyer. It could be anyone. And the trustee's job is when you die, let's say, they transfer that to a beneficiary. So you have your beneficiary will be, say, your kids. So all you, for a trust, you need a settler, you need a trustee, and you need a beneficiary. There's three things. So if you were to have a trustee, if, if they have that on trust, they can actually avoid inheritance tax because they're holding the asset. You don't own it. So when, when, you, when you die, it gets transferred to the beneficiary who then now is going to own it, but they, get, they benefit, benefit from it when you die. So that's why it's important to have this in place. And also, the reason why a trust is used is it also can protect an asset. So I'm going to give you an example in business. If I have a if I have a business, let's say you have a business A, yeah, and I do I trade. Let's say I'm a let's say I'm a plumber. I'll give that's the right. easiest word I can use. I trade with this business A. Let's say I'm trading, and then I have a customer who doesn't like me and tries to sue my business, this A. And let's say I want to transfer my business to my loved one. If someone's trying to sue this business, any of the debts and anything else affects this business, I can then lose a lot of money. Like they yeah. can get all of the assets. So the reason why trust is used and why we, we I'm going to give you a basic structure is most people have, don't technically most people don't, we don't really own anything when you do things correctly. Yes. And the, the way you're going to do it, and I'm giving you an example, is we, there's, a, always, there's always a holding company, there's always, always a subsidiary, and then you have a business. That is the basic structure which most people can use and follow. A holding company is used to hold an asset. And the reason why we use holding companies is because we can transfer things away from the asset to the holding company. And that, that's usually held in the trust. Or well, sometimes you can have a trust company that owns a holding company, but let's say we use the holding company. So, for example, if I have a business, for example, and let's say I have a plumbing company, for example, and let's say it grows, I do really, really well. Let's say I've got loads of contracts. If I want it to be smart, I will have a holding company. I'll have the plumbing company that does the business. The holding company will own this. And it, and because they own is a separate vehicle, a subsidiary and a subsidiary will own the business. So we have the holding company subsidiary business. Let's say when this company makes money, most of the assets get transferred to the subsidiary. And let's say yeah. that gets transferred to the holding company. And if you sue this business, you can protect the assets by transferring it all up. No, and see. that's the reason why you use a trust and no. or hold, and have a structure that way. No, that's definitely interesting. Thank you for sharing that as well, Vincent. No. Um, and yeah, just progressing on with it, like, uh, one thing I've been very interested in is like the wealth vehicles and different vehicles that you teach and that mm -hmm. you um, preach. So like, if you could just go into, you know, a bit more detail about those vehicles that you've listed, you said the property game and um, mm -hmm. business flipping, all that stuff. Why are those vehicles great for building wealth? Okay. So property, the reason why property is a good vehicle and I don't like property because I've grown up on property, but it's very, mm -hmm. very valuable. And, the reason why we need to understand this, and I'm going to go back to where the infrastructure works, is that money isn't really real, if you really think about it. Debt is actually how the world operates on. And mm. the reason why I'm going to give you an example, because I had this, I had a client and we had this, I'm going to give you a good example. If I wanted to go to the bank tomorrow and I said to them, I want you to give me 200,000 pounds in cash 
the bank doesn't even have the money. They're going to have to make an appointment for me. And it takes a long time because I've tried it. And it takes two to three weeks. They said, we haven't got that for you. We need to arrange an appointment for us to get the money to you so you can take out that cash. Mm. So they, they don't, the banks don't even hold, they don't even have those in deposits anyway. So the reason why people need to understand debt is debt is effectively, is how the world works effectively. And I'm going to give you a good example of how debt works. Because people always say, and you need to understand this, is that if you look at um, global GDP, every year it goes up. So global GDP was about 103 trillion uh, for this coming year. I think it was 98 the year before, about 94. So it's always going up. And the reason why it's going up is because when we look at the capital markets, debt, is one of the is one of the biggest systems that's used and what companies use to build wealth is one of the biggest vehicles and people need to understand for so from property for example if you go for example the average person buys a house right mm. you put a deposit down let's say mm. let's say let's say the house is a hundred thousand pounds right and we've got a let's say what ten percent mortgage we've got five percent remember let's give it ten percent because it makes it easier so you put down a thousand pounds for a hundred thousand pound house yeah yeah and then the bank then is going to loan you the other amount so let's say you put a thousand pounds the bank's going to loan you ninety nine thousand pounds that's what your mortgage would be on right yeah but they're not really loaning you ninety nine thousand pounds because there's interest so let's say they're really loaning you maybe two hundred thousand pounds but you're going to pay that over 30 years on the payment. So the reason why you, people need to understand it is that you're paying that over 35 years at, at an interest rate. So you don't really mm. see it because you're only paying £300 a month. But if you look at your agreement in principle, you're paying about £200,000. So you're, you owe the bank £200,000. Now, wow. let's say the property that you bought, let's just say you bought it, let's say it's worth... Um, a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Let's mm. give a good example. So now, after a while, you have fifty thousand pounds in equity for that for that property, effectively. Right. Okay. So, but you owe technically you owe two hundred thousand pounds. So let's say the property, let's say it's worth its equity. So let's say the property is worth two hundred fifty thousand pounds. Let's make it easy. It's two hundred fifty thousand pounds. So you have say fifty thousand pound equity. So you put down a certain amount and now it's, it's gone up in value. For you, let's say you wanted to save £50,000 from yeah. your salary. That might be quite difficult. But say you're putting a small amount down and you're paying it off and then say after a few years you get £50,000. Now you've got equity and the value of it's gone up. So that's why the property game, if you do it right, and the reason why people need to understand this is that there's only three ways really people make money in property and people don't understand the three ways. So there's the first way is you're buying a house to then flip it and buy multiple houses to rent it out and effectively get an income. Yeah. But you're using the capital, you're paying down the capital with people that rent it. So when people think that the, the money is going up, Effectively, it isn't. It's just that the loan that you're paying down is going down in principle. So when you pay it back every single month, you're bringing that loan down. And effectively, if it goes up, then you get equity. So that's why you make money that way. But that's that's based on the market where it's going up. So that's the first way. The second way is you can buy a house and flip the house. So let's say it's a rundown house. You buy it. Let's say it's £100,000. But on auction, is, is you buy it for fifty. So when you buy it for £50,000, and let's say it takes you £20,000 to do it up, then you bring it back, say it goes up to one hundred and twenty. Once you've re once you've done it up, then you have a market value of one hundred and twenty. you can finance that out and then effectively do something else. So that's flipping the house. So some people do that. And then the third stage is a bit of both. And this is where, this goes to the development side. So you can then buy, let's say you... This stage gets complicated, but let's say I buy, I'm a developer, but I'm going to give yeah. you the easiest way to be a developer. Let's say I buy land or finance a development and, yeah. and there's something called developer's finance, which is available 
to so the gov what happens is the government will have a scheme and they might need a certain amount of houses to be built you can then apply through that scheme and get funding from the government and the government will fund you let's say 20 percent or something like that that 20 percent, you could use that funding to then go let's say you want to buy the land or you want to build on it you can get an investor who invests that and then you build it and then once you've got that you, then you have a rent it out or you sell it to an investor so that's development finance that's that's another way or the second way is you buy a a free you can buy a four bedroom property yeah and then you can split it so let's say i buy a four bedroom house i get the freehold to it i do it up you have to get a license but the license is very simple to get nowadays and you split it let's say you spend fifty thousand pounds you can split a four bedroom house into two levels you have two bedrooms on the top two bedrooms on the bottom now you've got two new properties and then you can now you have a leasehold to these two so you can sell the lease to someone that's two properties let's say it's four hundred thousand you sell them for like two maybe two fifty or three hundred thousand each then or you can rent it out but you then now can own the freehold and then you can sell the lease out to an investor. That's the third way that you can make money. But there are three ways you can really make money in property. And the, the thing that's very important is people don't understand the difference between buying a house as an investment or buying a house to live in your house and thinking that's an investment when yeah. it isn't. Yeah. And, and I think people need to understand that those rules, you, you don't have to live in it. You can rent and buy investment properties and then just live off the income from renting them. So people need to understand, people always say, I bought my house and it's an investment. It's not, no. because you're living in it. It's not making you a return. It's not making you any money until you actually, and this is why I say go back to the money principles. Where's the transfer? Until you sell that property, it hasn't yeah. made you any money. And no. you're sitting on the equity. It's just, it's just an invented figure until you realize it. No, definitely. That's super interesting. Um, like, I think, you know, um, a final question I'd like to ask you before we round off um, is like if you were starting all over again you lost everything um, mm -hmm. and you're young and I think mm -hmm. that's quite key what would you mm -hmm. be doing? Oh it's easy it's so easy now I always say the most important thing and I always say is your income that is it mm. I don't know I say what you've won in life is it's not about, for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I go back to zero every month because when, I, in entrepreneurship, I pay people. Mm. So I just live, I live, I can just live a certain life. So I'm comfortable living a certain life. For me, I just work. So I, I'm not the same as everyone else. Some people need to have a certain amount in the bank. But for me, I'm always flipping the money. because I don't believe in money. I mm. don't hold on to money. Like I need right. to have income and cash flow and then everything else is investment. So I'm going to give you, because I, I did do a video on this, but I'll, 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 I'll break it down now about uh, cash flow. And people need to understand this. If, if cash flow is the most important thing, mm. effectively, because all, everything else, until it's realized, it doesn't really exist. So I always say to everyone, and, and mindset where you are, it depends where you are in life. So I can't go to a homeless person and tell them you need to do these couple of steps to be wealthy because it, it's, it's not gonna work. So the first thing that everyone needs to have is they need to have balance. And I do a series called um, How You Do Anything is How You Do Everything because your personal life yeah. and your work life has to match. Right. And when I say this, I mean your personal life has to be simple. Yeah. Your work life can be crazy. Yeah. But if your work life's crazy and your personal life is crazy, you're never ever, it's not going to work. So the first thing that I say to people is, do we have the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So do we have, the first thing you need to understand, do we have shelter? Do we have water? food they're the three and then do we have income they're the three things what is that what is that looking like for you first so i always say that if you're a student you live at home to an, to an extent and you don't pay rent that's a massive advantage because yes. if you've got a job 
you can now stack your income. Like this is what I say, what you're doing, what are your priorities. You can work like you. It's not about how much you make. It's about what you do with your money. I know people that make 200, 250,000 pounds a year, but they're still in the same position as other people. It's just, they have more stuff. They have a big, better apartment. They have higher credit cards. They have cars, they have everything. And that's why I say the asset and liability is very important. And I've got a video of 15 secrets that's coming out, which tells you what you have to do. But to break it down, I would personally focus on growing my income. And that's the most, that's the important stage number one. So from corporate law, I'd say in terms of income, I'd say if you have a thousand or two thousand disposable, yeah. effectively for at least six to seven months, you can then start your journey on building wealth. But you you need you need that first. So yeah. I don't know how you're gonna do that, but you need to figure out how to do that. So I always say to people, the game's the game's actually changed now. If I was to go back to now, I wouldn't go and work for a corporate now. I wouldn't. What I would would personally, I personally would go and do a delivery. I would I would probably get a van and I'll just do delivery driving. Because <laughs> yeah. you can make three hundred of two hundred and fifty pounds a day. I'm on my own schedule now. And then I can now I would just bang out six days a week. Let's say I need to get four or five grand a month. I would do that. And then now in my spe- now I can design, okay, I'm gonna get this amount of money this month. And then now and then I can say, okay, let me just get that. How much do I need to live on? So let's say rent and the rest. And what you've got to have to do is sacrifice. You're gonna to have to say, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm just gonna work and I'm gonna get this certain amount of money and stack this certain amount of money. You don't know what you're going to do with it yet, but you just want to be in positive first. And that's why I say you're holding on to money. Yeah. Then you're going to transfer it. So I don't know what you're going to transfer it to. Figure that out with the percentages. We can figure out it's what you transfer it to. But yeah. you want to have consistency. And I say wealth is built between two and five years. If you do something consistently for two to five years with a strategy, you can then build wealth but what wealth is to you is, is different to someone else. Someone yep. might want two houses and live off an income. It depends. Do you need to know what is your what is your sweet spot? But that's what I would do. Or you can make money online now. You can do I'm gonna I've got a few things on my list actually, which I'm gonna give to people because I've done it for another podcast. Um Go and share that list and no that's... excuse. God, no excuse. I'm gonna give this list because it's it's a lot easier now than it has been in the last year. And and the reason why I say there's no excuse because I had I took an Uber the other day, and there was an older gentleman. Yeah, who picked me up on um on a Saturday, and I said to him, "Oh, how come?" He said, "Oh, it's, this Uber is really good. It gives me something extra to do, and I get a good income from it." And he's retired, but he said, "Why not?" He's done this, yeah. And and this helps him. So I'm going to give you a list of things because as I'm a, as I'm a, I'm a lovely guy. So, you know, so there's no excuse. So I'm going to give you the list. So this is for anyone. And this is for the working moms. As long as you can make some money, I just need you to get the income. That's all you need. And you can do it from sitting in your bedroom now. The world is so easy. Someone delivers food. And this is why I say the living standards in the Western world is so high. There's no excuse. So I'm going to give you examples. And this is this, these are things that you can do. Careers. To get the six figures, I'm going to show you how to be a contractor because, to be honest with you, being a contractor is where you can make your money. I, I really made a lot of my money being a contractor. So I'll give you an example. Like, for example, when I was when you're working as a lawyer, you make start you graduate at 60, I was in about 120. But when I went as a contractor, I started making 500 to to 1,000 pounds a day. So I realized I don't need to do that. I can go in as a contractor. Then you make that money. You can make 10, 15 a month. I'll say the sweet spot. I'd say five to six thousand pounds a month is enough for someone to start doing something, depending on your lifestyle. Right. If you live in London, <clears throat> I'd say a sweet spot for me in London was about 10. But that's doable, isn't it? But I'd say the average person, I'd say three, three thousand pounds a month, depending on your lifestyle, is doable to start. Uh, or uh, two thousand is not enough because I'm I'm gonna break it down the reason why. But if you if you're saving enough, I say three thousand, two thousand five to three is doable, but you, you need to really live 
really, really good, really clean. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. So the first thing on the list, this is, this is a list of 20 things that are, you can do. Some of them are recession-proof to go and get money. So I'm, I want you to just, no excuse, you're just going to put in the work. And I'm, I'm flexible for the moms because we'll go down the list. So the first thing is an SIA badge, a security badge. Having an SIA badge, doing security or doing corporate security, whatever it is, you can do that on weekends. It's flexible and you could probably bring in 800 to 1,000 pounds a month if you worked every other week, every weekend. So yeah. you need an extra 1,000 pounds and you got that badge, you can work anytime. I used to have it in uni. I used to work, so there was no excuse. So that's, that's one thing. And that's wherever you go, you can make at least uh, eight to 10 pounds an hour, 12 hour shifts, bam, that's about 100 or 200 a day, something like that. Tax, oh. whatever, 150, let's say. But do two weekends, that's 200. You can make about 1,000 pounds if you've just done a weekend. So that's extra money. And say you had a normal job. I'm just saying if you wanted to, in a weekend, you have to get up in the morning, nine to maybe nine to nine or whatever. You can do it. And you're not going to be too tired. You can do it on the weekends. You just, and you can sit down, you know, do a couple of bits. It's a simple mm -hmm. job. Simple but, it, you know, you know it's, it's reasonable. The next thing is cybersecurity apprentice. The government have a scheme. And there are courses. You can go on Udemy. There are some organizations that sponsor this. You can do the research, but you cybersecurity, they need people in it. So you can be at the apprentice of cybersecurity. You could do this qualification between eight and nine months, and you could be making a minimum of 60 all the way to 120. Yearly, by the way. Cybersecurity is a big bit. And these are these are big courses money. you can do now. You go on mm. Udemy, go on uh, the government, have a website for this. It's an apprenticeship. Do the apprenticeship, and employers will pay you. What you're going yeah. to do is you're going to, they're going to pay for the apprenticeship. You might have to stay there for a year or two, but you're going to build your CV because you can be a contractor after. You're yeah. just going to use them to pay for it. And then you're going to, after two years, you're flying. So you don't even have to go to university, by the way. This is something you can do. Apprenticeships have, have come back now. The next one is compliance qualification. So you can go to Udemy now and do something in compliance. Get, get a qualification, get certified. I think it might take you about a year to two, but once you get a few qualifications, you can work in compliance. Compliance is always, there's always jobs in compliance. They're not going anywhere. They need them. The next is a transcriber. So the medical profession and pharmaceutical companies, they have meetings where they need the notes to be transcribed. And you can do this online, uh, 11 to 15 an hour. And you can trans, so as a transcript, you just type in up, you listen to the audio, and you type it up and you can do that anywhere in the world couple of hours you know if you do treat it like a job maybe two four days yeah make 100 200 pound a day try anywhere in the world you can do trans so this is for the moms you're at home transcriber the next thing data entry and copywriters but i'm going to use i say data entry because there's always someone that needs the data to be managed so if you're good with social media you're good with posting you're good with creating content. You can now use AI to do it as well. Uh, so we, we can go on to that one. But the businesses need data entry and copyright. So you can go, you, this, this requires work. You're going to approach businesses and say, we can save you this on your admin. We can save you this, whatever. We can handle your socials. Most businesses have the money and you're going you're gonna to manage, you're going to be the social media manager, but you're going to charge them a fraction of they went to a social media management company. So you can provide that service set up the page for them, post for them, and then you can just charge them a fee. So you're going to get the followers up to a certain level, engagement. So copywriting has been around. It still is a lot of competition, but it does. The next is a data analyst. So data is very, very important now. And these are careers. Again, data is important. There's another thing called information governance. They're both together. But basically, information governance, the data world and how we manage data and legal terms and all these other things information governance is one of the biggest growing fields if you can get into that you do a qualification i think six months day rates of between 500 to a thousand pounds a day as inf inf information right. governance officer so it's a skill it's in tech but it's a skill anyone can if you've got the time 
you can do it. The next one is a company secretary. This is what I done. And it's a very easy one. Once when I was working as a lawyer, I realized that if I went to move around the world, I, I didn't have the, I can't go to another country and practice and do the exam. So I become a, I became a company secretary. And a company secretary is an advisor to the board. You sit on the board. You're like the administrator for a company. So we're, we're, with a company, you have a C-suite. We call it the C-suite. So you have the CEO, the CFO, chief financial officer. Some companies have a chief marketing officer and then they'll have a company secretary. And the company secretary does the board meetings, minutes the board meetings, advises them on any legal issues, uh, corporate governance. And you're actually, I'll call it, you're the secretary of state, effectively. And you are the intermediary between the CEO and the board because you're accountable to the board. You, you actually sit with the board, you do the board meetings, you advise the CEO how you can get decisions on the board. But company secretary... You don't need many qualifications. There's something called ICSA. Anyone can do it. Don't have to go to university. There's a qualification. It's two years, but they can sponsor you. And salaries range between um, six, 50, 60s. If you become company secretary for FTSE 100 all the way to uh, like 500, 750, getting compensation. So literally, that's, that's the career. It's your oyster. The next one is a financial ombudsman. These are professional qualifications. Again, um, you don't need to have a, a degree or anything. Uh, basically, when there's ever disputes between, uh, let's say, you and a credit card company that goes to a financial ombudsman, that's, is it in your agreements when you read it? Or there's something called, um, uh, what's it called? Ad, uh, um, it'll come back to mediation, basically. That's what financial ombudsman is. You have mm. mediated as well. So these are careers. You do a couple of qualifications and you get a day rate or you can work as a as a independent like a your like own self-employed person so these you don't need qualifications for these um data governance i mentioned that do you know what a roper is a, a what a roper a roper a roper rope and ah oh, so a roper do you know what that is no i don't have a clue what okay okay a roper this is a career it can be a bit some people might see it a bit dangerous but do you know when you look at big buildings yes. and you see someone cleaning the windows? Mm. That's what a roper is. It's a window cleaner, but it's for high-rise buildings. But the reason why I say it, because you do this qualification, I think it costs about £500. But the, earning, the earnings from it, minimum day rate for ropers, is about £500 a day. Day rate. That's not you having your own company or whatever. And you can travel around the world. There's in Dubai everywhere. There's a big demand for them. There's been around a long, but Roper. If you have, if you don't mind, and you have all the equipment <laughs> and everything on the building, just window cleaning buildings, you could be a Roper. You have to pay for the qualification. I think it takes about six to six months to a year to do, but you want to make money, you can be a Roper. The next thing, a software engineer. Again, software engineers are in demand. We need them. Again, yeah. government scheme. High earning potentials. I don't want to go too much. If you're any, if you're good at cleaning, let's say, I'm not saying it's not what you want to do, but I've had this in university. I had it once. Um, me and my friends, we needed some money, and we were just thinking, like, how do we get money? We need money, and it was like, we're clean. And this was in London, by the way. And we just said, you know what? Let's just put up an ad. We put up an ad on Gumtree as a cleaner. I got a phone line. I acted like the manager and we said, we're going to charge this amount because we're really good cleaners because a lot of cleaners are shit. And there wasn't even many British cleaners there as well. Charged, we were charging like 100 or 120 an hour just to clean. And we just went to people's houses and just cleaned. We done that, we done the ironing service. And I think we made about a grand that day. We split Jeez. it between both of us, 500 pounds. We just went, put our advert up and we got loads of calls clean, 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 set them up, all appointments, the phone number was banging. We had retaining clients. Imagine we done it as a cleaning company, but yeah, yeah easy. So if you, if you can clean right now, you can go out and get cash, literally, Stop. on the spot. Uh -huh. um, delivery drivers. Again, if you need money, you can now Uber and that, they pay you on the day. So you mm. can actually now cash out, just go and do the delivery. So if you do the hours, you can easily make 60 to 100 a day if you if you look at the average job which is 24 to 25 thousand pounds a year 
the day rate you're making a day is about 90 to 100 pounds. That's the same as the deliveries. <laughs> so you need extra money, you can go and do, and do deliveries. Yeah. Uber driver and even more. Um, project manager. This is another career that you don't even need to go to university. You just need something called a Prince One, qualification 500 pounds. You need some experience, but I'm gonna give you a tip. Everything in life is a project. So your job, anything you do, if you're admin, whatever you do is a project because you have to do that project. Yeah. You just turn your whole skills that you work into a project and you've got a project management CV. So yes, you can do that. Wow. So project project management. And if you do the qualification, it takes five, six months, you can be making minimum 300 to 500 pounds a day. So are the six months. And, and you can contract with this as well. So project management, what have you got? Okay, clinical trials. If you're sitting at home and you're a yeah. university student, no, I need people. I'm not, I, there's no excuse because my friend in university yeah. used to do this and he, gave, he came out of university with eight grand because clinical trials is, to be honest, is a risk, but it isn't a risk because anything you use from creams to medical thing, they actually need you because they sometimes they need someone with asthma. They need someone between the age range. You they they provide you the facilities. You sit in the lab, or you do your trials. You sit in the they provide a hospital, PlayStation, everything. You, clinical trials range. I don't know range from five hundred. Some some are two thousand pounds for two weeks, and it's tax free by the way. So mm -hmm. if you're sitting at home and you're and you don't mind the risk, and you're a student. You can actually do clinical. He used to do clinical trials. He never had a summer job, and he done clinical trials. But there's a risk there. But like I say, there's there's money. There's money out there. Okay, what's the next one? Online reviewers. Social media. You're on social media all day. Most of the social media companies now you can sign up to them online. There's so many online review platforms. You can sign up to them, and they pay you to be online. You review content online. You do reviews. You get, you get paid like a base rate. But if you're online all day and you're sitting at home, you know, you can do that. Well, yeah. Testing, there's a testing experts as well. So you can actually make money to take to test. So some, some tech companies, they want you to test products. Again, there's a platform for me. I can't remember, but just Google it. There's so much on TikTok. You can find it. Just type it in TikTok. You can sign up to a platform and just test some of their things. Um online TikTok moderators or moderators in general. So, you know, when you post on TikTok, yep. there's a moderator that checks your posts that have guidelines and you can go and work with, all of them have it. You do a course, they pay for it. Good earning potentials between 60 to maybe $100,000 a year. And you can be a moderator and you check everything people post. There's people that actually check them to ensure that they comply. They don't have this, this content. So you know when if you ever get, and you get banned or the post get, yeah. doesn't go through? That is an online moderator and all of the platforms have them. They, they're crying out for them and they actually will pay you to actually go and do the courses. So there's no excuse. Um, and you can find that if you type in web free, web jobs, you can find loads of these online stuff. So, that's one of us. And then you can watch ads. I'm going to risk through these quickly. Watching ads, mm. there's a job for that. They're paid to review ads. Um, virtual assistant. So now most of the platform, like most of the um, VAs now, so you upskill, most people need virtual assistants. And Definitely. if you can do that in your spare time, help people uh, be an assistant, do admin, you can charge your rate. You can get a project, charge them 20 pound hour. You're good at PowerPoint. You can edit a document. Done. And then you can make money. You can charge them a fee. You can say, I'll, I'll charge you 200 pound for editing your document, doing that. Imagine you do five, six clients and just sit on the computer all day. You can make a thousand pound or 500 pound a day doing that. If you just treat you like a job. So you're actually sitting at your own home, by the way. This, this, this is why I say the game has changed so much. There is no excuse. You don't even have to go out and do a nine to five anymore. You can just sit at home and make yeah. money on your computer. Yeah. So the next one is um, digital marketing. Very, mm. very big. Is There are different courses out there. You have to do your due diligence. I'm not too sure, but I have people that do it. That's why I'm, I'm just saying you can make money from doing that. Amazon product tester. Again, 
you can they pay you to test products. YouTube moderator, I said, and then the last one I'm going to give you actually, which is a really good one, is Apple Home Home Advisors. So mm. you, they give you a kit. So when you phone up Apple and you hear yeah. someone working from home, yeah. they have Home Advisors and they pay between eighteen pounds an hour. Amex, American Express have one. I have one when I when I have my platinum card and I phone them up. Mm. They have that. Um, they all have them. Um, Apple have one. All of them. All of the tech companies have them. <laughs> 18 pounds an hour where they give you a they give you a test kit, everything to work from home. And there's a lot of others. So I've gone through at least 22 things you can do with no qualifications, by the way. Some of them were, but you know, you can do it tomorrow. So there's no, no excuses excuse. whatsoever. Whatsoever. No. No, it is the easy it's the easiest time to make money Definitely. than we've ever had in history. And if you it's either you want to do it or you don't. But if you're gonna sit at home. And watch YouTube. Why don't you just get paid and 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 watch it at the same time? No, definitely, definitely. And I think that's a uh, an amazing place to wrap up this pod, Vincent. Um, yeah. I appreciate you coming on. Um, and you spit so much useful knowledge out there for anyone to really progress in their journey. Um, whether they're in a corporate job, building a business, whatever it is, you know, there's so much useful facts and advice to take on and uh, really go out there and start building. So, yeah, thank you very much. Any last words to the viewers, Vincent? Anything you'd like to say? I just want to say, look, the information is out there. But the thing is, yeah, the reason why I'm saying this and the reason why I want to be positive, because I'm mm. going to end on this one, because the government, they want to put the daggers in our back. They want to take the power from the mass. But together, we can take the power and put the power right back. And that's how we're going to end. <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing you heard it right there um so yeah no definitely and like feel free to you know follow vincent out on his um socials posting you know post more than daily don't you, you post a lot of great great content um about building wealth changing mindset all that useful stuff so please give that a follow um link will be down in the description and for everyone out there you know just keep killing it keep smashing it um reach out to vincent ask him questions i'm sure be I'm happy to ask it. And also check out Wealth University launching on the 14th of May. Well, part of it's launching on 14th of May. So make sure to check out that. Um, and yeah, have a great day, everyone. And uh, yeah, make sure to stay tuned for the next episode. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Cheers. Good stuff. Cheers, Vincent. Lovely.